thank you all for being here tonight. Um, it's hard to see so many uh, who are interested in this case, uh, which is of such utmost importance. I visited Julian on, on Sunday, and it was uh, good to see that he is a little better after he was moved out of the uh, isolation in the health ward. That was, of course, a result of a lot of pressure uh, by the lawyers, mostly behind the scenes, pressure from the general public, and interesting enough, because the, petition, the, the inmates in Belmar's prison petitioned for <laughs> Given a world where the prisoners in Belmars have more humanity than uh, most people in government. That's but as I, it's always difficult to leave him behind when you would exit and go out of Belmars prison. It's, it's always your heart sinks uh, to, uh, to uh, know that, that he has to spend more time there. Uh, and I was standing there outside the Belmars and uh, watching back on these uh, ugly walls surrounding the prison. And I was thinking about the walls and history. We recently celebrated that it was 30 years since a wall was torn down, a wall that was uh, raised to uh, imprison people, to keep them inside, and to keep the truth on the outside. The wall in Belmars is keeping a man on the inside who exposed the truth to us. How on earth did we come to this position that we have to fight for the freedom of an innocent man, a journalist who exposed the truth? That is a serious thing that uh, we are now facing. And uh, in three weeks, of course, we are we're going to the, through the hearings. Uh, the, uh, the opposition, the United States government has uh, shown some of its hands. What they what they are going to maintain, and it's it's alarming to read through uh, these documents. It's alarming on many reasons. Of course, they maintain that he is not a journalist to start with, which is outrageous. It's outrageous that some actually in journalism are still maintaining that they have some qualms about accepting him as a journalist. I say it's outrageous. We talk about a man who's been a, a powerful member of the Journalist Union of Australia, MEAA, for more than a decade. It's outrageous to call a man a non-journalist who has received the highest journalistic award uh, bestowed in his country, the Walkley Award, which is the equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize. It's outrageous that somebody would maintain that he's not a journalist, a man that has, and the organization that, uh, that he uh, was, was a, a, a found, founded and is well of. Uh, received uh, almost two dozen awards since then for the publications, for the achievement. So of course he's a journalist. And we don't want to live in a society where, where Trump or Pompeo decides who is a journalist or not, or for that matter, Boris Johnson. If you give that power to, uh, to the political elite, that is basically taking away a lot of press freedom. That's basically giving them the power to decide what is news and what is not. So it's outrageous to see that. But of more concern is that it is maintained in these documents that were submitted uh, just recently, only about a week ago, that uh, they are of the opinion, the Americans, that the First Amendment protection does not apply to foreign nationals. Does not apply to foreign nationals. What does that mean? It means that on the same time that they are taking, uh, deciding that they can go after any journalist anywhere in the world, at the same time, they decide that they are saying that all non-U.S. journalists, all foreign journalists, do not have First Amendment protection. That is outrageous. It is totally outrageous and put everybody, every journalist at risk who is covering national security issues, who are covering anything that might uh, embarrass the United States and uh, that they might perceive as being in opposition to their interests. That is a very serious concern. They also outline what kind of condition, condition Julian can expect if he is renditioned to the United States. We are talking about solitary confinement. And they admit it. They don't call it solitary confinement. We don't call it solitary confinement, they say. We call it just special administrative measures. And we know all these wordplay. I mean, what do they call torture? No, enhanced interrogation technique. So, he is facing 
terrible condition and a certain death in America if it's extradited. And of course, it will be a huge battle uh, ahead. Uh, I'm sure that Jennifer will talk about the, the, the precedent being set here for journalists, which is extremely serious. And this is a basic attack on press freedom. It is outlined that there has been a lot of harm done by the publication of 2010-11. An, an entire decade has passed that they've not been able to present any evidence of physical harm to anybody. At the same time, what did we think expose? Let's talk about journalists who were killed. Remember the collateral murder video where two Reuters journalists were slaughtered with hollow explosive bullets, which are designed to penetrate tanks and armored vehicles. Let's remember the names. The, the excellent photojournalist Namir Nur al Din uh, and his assistant Saeed Sma from Reuters. Let's not forget the, well, that the Wikileaks exposed the cover-up in Spain uh, where the government was complicit in, in covering up the investigation and the justice for Jose Cuso, the, uh, the Spanish cameraman that was bombarded on the balcony of the Palestine Hotel when the U.S. Army entered into Baghdad in 2003. There was a blatant attempt to cover that up. <coughs> and those are just the, the journalists that we, are, that we uh, uh, exposed the killing of and the injustice and the war crime that was basically involved in their deaths. But all the other, the war crimes, the uh, corruption, the truth about these two wars, the truth about Guantanamo Bay, that is now what is, he is being tried for. That's what they want him, uh, uh, that in basically U.S. prison for. And make no mistake about the political angle here. Uh, <laughs> When Mike Pompeo was, was uh, uh, director of the CIA, he coined this term that, uh, that Wikileaks was a non-state hostile intelligence service. What does it entail? Yes, he was giving the, the argument that they would then push that this was not journalism, but espionage, that they would go after Julian on that basis, the espionage act. Uh, equating journalism and telling the truth with, with espionage, that's us. What a signal is that to journalists? Uh, Pompeo, of course, has his fingerprints are all over the Julian Assange case. And uh, now we know that he is going to be running for the a Senate seat. And who is going to be his primary backer? That is a casino magnate called Adelson. Uh, incidentally, that's the same person who actually financed the disgusting espionage in the Ecuadorian embassy, the Spanish firm that uh, uh, were supposed to be looking after Julian and his security, but spied upon him. Spied upon meeting with, with, uh, with, uh, with the lawyers, with Jen, with doctors. So to connect the dots, this is the political corruption we're dealing with. We are dealing here with a political persecution. This has nothing to do with justice. Military as well, military. Yes. But we need to fight. We need to fight and tear down this wall around Julian. We need to free him. And I remember when, uh, when uh, shortly after he, he was arrested, so he, uh, uh, we asked him what to relay to the journalists outside. Well, what should we tell them? And, and his remark was, well, tell them it's not about me. It's about them. It's about the future of journalism. It's the gravest attack on journalism that I have seen in my lifetime, and uh, the most serious attack on journalism in, in latter times. And if this goes ahead, if this exhibition goes ahead, we are entering in, into a, a, a new dark ages. And that is, <coughs> we have to fight, we have to team together everywhere. Thank you. journalists to receive that. So um, thank you, Kristen.